which is very of mm. the challenge of continuity. Continuity. Yes, which is a very very big challenge as we know today mm -hmm. and was perhaps even more of a challenge back then. So up until this point, I'm just going to do a quick five second review. We talked about how the Jewish community started here with the Recife 23. We talked about what the Jewish community was like. We talked about Jews in the state. And as we saw, other than some minor legal disabilities, some mild anti-Semitism, for the most part, Jews had it quite good in this country, in the colonial period and even better in the early Republican period. No economic restrictions, very little political restriction, certainly far better than anywhere in Europe at the time. At the same time as Jews had it very good, Judaism did not. Remember, we talked about who chose to come to this country. Anyone who chose to come, Judaism was not number one on their priority list, because if it was, they wouldn't have come. There was economics. Economics, right. Mm -hmm. That's why they came. Economics. Um, they did not come for Jewish infrastructure. They did not, they did not come to enroll their children in SAR. Mm -hmm. There was nothing like that. Um, there was no Jewish education that was organized, so they were really coming to a wasteland for economic reasons. So that combination of this very inviting external society, plus this lack of strong Jewish communal ties, good morning, is what we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna spend quite a bit of time today looking at portraits, portraits of colonial Jews and early Republican Jews. Um, so but before we look at portraits, I, I really love looking at portraits. Um, so before we do that though, um, we have to talk a teeny bit about what portrait, portraiture meant in um, early America, and specifically what it meant to Jews. So having your portrait painted in the 18th and 19th century was a symbol of status. It was a symbol that you had made it to a certain economic echelon in society. Um, you had in, become bourgeois or upper middle class or upper class. Um, you were of a certain ilk in society, not just vis-a-vis -vis money, but vis-a-vis -vis sort of social status. So it was certainly something that people liked to have done in Europe and also in America. America was backwater not just for Jews, it was backwater for everybody. So there weren't really very famous um, painters here. Um, so people would come over from, would bring painters over from England and they would stay here for a few years and paint everybody's portraits. Um, people um, copied the styles that were being used in England. England trained everybody. Um, if there were American-born artists, they went to be trained in England, um, and that was the way it worked. Now, in Europe, Jews would never have been in a world where they would have portraits painted, in the 18th century, certainly, and even in the early 19th century. Um, it just would never have occurred to them. They were living in cloistered Jewish environments. They were not part of the bourgeois world outside. They were not wealthy enough. They just, it would never have occurred to them. But um, in America, they were part of the external society and they did do well economically earlier on. So they do get their portraits painted in a very interesting way and they use their portraits to show their acceptance into American society. Now, we know that portraiture is really not a part of Jewish tradition. We don't do that. It's not, not that it's a bad thing, but it's just not a thing, right? Um, Jewish tradition tends to be verbal not written. When I think about what people left for their children, um, medieval, early modern Jews, what did they leave for their children? It wasn't a portrait of themselves, it was an ethical will, um, or a sefer that they wrote, or something like that. Jews are about words, not so much about images. Well, in the uh, Ten Commandments, it tells us not to make it. Right, and, and obviously that influenced the culture, for sure. Um, so because Jews are sort of a latecomers to this secularized bourgeois world, they adopt portrait practices um, as a symbol of the world they want to enter into. It's not a Jewish thing, but it is part of the world that they want to be a part of. It's symbolic of who they want to be. Okay, so with that background in mind, we're going to take a look at our first portrait. This is called Martha Levy at the Spinet. And it's actually a later portrait for our period. It's in 1810, so America has been established. There's a Bill of Rights, there's a Constitution. Um, and it was painted by quite a famous portrait artist named Thomas Sully. Um, 
he kept notes on the portrait. It was started on November 11th, 1820, and it was 1810, I'm sorry, and it was finished on December 16th. It took a little over a month, and it cost $60. So I looked up what $60 costs in today's dollars, and it's about $1,200. So not that, that's not so horrendously expensive, but it was you know enough that it was a substantial kind of a thing. So what do you see? What do you think of Martha Levy? What can you tell me about her? She's young. She is very young. She's 12 in this painting. Yeah. She is 12. She probably got married at 15 or something, but she, she is 12. What else? She looks very much American. She's very American, right? She's, she is wearing style of the day. She's not dressed in any kind of sneeze fashion or anything like that. Um, she's quite beautifully dressed. She's clearly wealthy, right? Mm -hmm. What else? She, what? Can she can afford to have spinet lessons. Ah, she can afford to have spinet lessons. This is very important. That means not only is she of a certain economic background, but there's a certain commitment to cultural education in her family, right? She's, she's literate. She's literate in music. She's turning the pages of the, of the book. She has a certain, I mean, learning to play the spinet was, was a certain status symbol among girls and young women of that era. So she's wealthy. She's literate. She's well-dressed. She's cultivated and she's elegant. She dressed in the fashion of the time and she was 12 years old, young. So can this painting tell us something about Jewish life in America and in 1810? People, Maybe. People settled into the culture. Right? Okay, for sure. It shows that Jews settled into the culture of America, right? The beginning of assimilation. Beginning of assimilation. They're certainly very acculturated here. Okay, ready for the backstory? Martha Levy's not Jewish. <laughs> She was born in 1798. She died in 1889. She lived a long life. Her father was Jewish. His name was Judge Moses Levy. He was a very, from a very prominent Jewish family, very well-respected colonial Jewish family. He himself was born in America. Um, her mother was Mary Pierce Levy, an Episcopalian Methodist Christian. Martha was raised in Philadelphia as a Methodist. She married John Jones Milligan in Philadelphia in 1820. And she left no Jewish descendants, of course, because she herself was not Jewish. So whenever I teach about this painting, I always say to people, is this a Jewish painting? Is this Jewish? Is this important for Jewish history? What do you think? Is it a Jewish painting? No, but it shows you where Jews stood at that mm -hmm. time. Okay, so you're drawing a distinction between whether there's it's a Jewish painting, there's nothing Jewish about right? Like you look at it, there's nothing Jewish in the painting, right? It's devoid of any Jewish symbolism or anything like that. But it is certainly part of Jewish history in a very powerful way because when you see the title of that painting, Martha Levy, you think, oh, here's a painting about Jewish acculturation. And the real story is that it's actually a painting about Jewish intermarriage and disappearance. So it is a part of Jewish history. It's a really powerful part of Jewish history because it helps us think about what Jewish life was like for colonial Jews. We see the degree they wanted to fit in, right? We see how much she wanted to fit in, and she did. And it makes us think about the rate of intermarriage. So let's talk about that for a second. How typical was Martha Levy? Unfortunately, she was quite typical. Um, intermarriage w was very high. The rate of intermarriage was quite high in the colonial period. You're going to laugh when I tell you how high it was. It was 25%. We wish for such rates today um, because now, of course, we have rates in certain communities that are upwards of 80%. Um, thank God, not in our community, but in, in many communities in this country. So that seems very low to us. But as a basis for comparison, in every other Jewish community in the world at that time, the intermarriage rate was basically zero. So 25% is horrendous compared to everything else going on in the world at the time. Jews didn't even know non-Jews everywhere else in the world in 1810. They barely knew non-Jews. There were a few exceptional cases of people who knew non-Jews, Moses Mendelssohn, people like that. But for the most part, people were in Dorfuden, they were in small town Jews, they lived in Stettlach, they were not that well educated secularly, and they only knew Jews. Maybe they interacted in business a little bit with non-Jews. But there was no intermarriage. Not to mention the fact that in Europe, intermarriage was illegal in many places until the 20th century. So they wouldn't have happened anyway. So why was it so common in America? Well, we know the answers to that from the three previous weeks of, of learning together. Um, first of all, the community was very small. There are only 2,500 Jews. 
2.5 million people in this country at the time. And so we're a tenth of a percent, one tenth of one percent of the population is teeny. There aren't a lot of suitable mates <laughs> when you're in a community of 2,500. There are, you know, there are elderly, there are children, there are people who are already married. You know, how many single men and women are there to, to marry? And we see that as Jewish history in America goes on, people import spouses and there's all kinds of other stuff that goes on. But the pool of marriage um, partners is very small. Secondly, we know that this is a self-selecting population, right? So the people in this country came here because Judaism is not number one on their priority list. So if it's not number one on their priority list and there aren't a lot of Jewish people to mate with here, it's not such a leap to intermarry, right? It doesn't, it's not so crazy. The third reason, a lot of Jews in America were from Sephardic descent and had spent centuries as non-Jews and as hidden Jews. So they were much more sort of labile in terms of their attachment to Jewish practice and Jewish communal norms. And fourth of all, of course, we have a very welcoming external society. If you remember a couple weeks back, we read a letter that Rebecca Samuels had written back home to her family in Germany, where she says, we have no problems with the non-Jews. They're the best. It's just the Jews that are the problem. They're not religious. But the non-Jews are great, and they welcome us, and it's wonderful. And last time we met, we studied George Washington's letter, where he speaks to the Jews about how there's no bigotry in this country, and they're going to protect the Jews, et cetera. So this was a welcoming place. So if you combine all those four things, you see you've got real problems for Jewish continuity in this country. Obviously, this portrait tells us nothing about what Martha Levy thought about the fact that her father was Jewish. We know he was. We know that he was born to a very prominent Jewish family. Um, he actually, he was college educated. He went to the University of Pennsylvania. He graduated in 1776. Imagine having that as your graduation year. He was a trustee of Penn for 24 years. He was a member of the Philadelphia legislature. So while he's Jewish, he's very integrated into the external society. Um, so he's complicated, her father. And we don't know how she felt about that or if she did feel about it. We don't know if he ever spoke to her about being Jewish, whether he cared. We don't know. We just don't know. So what I'd like to argue about these portraits is that these American Jewish portraits, and we're going to look at a whole bunch of them, are actually symbolic of a greater theme in colonial and early Republican Jewish life. And that's the hidden nature of their Jewish identity. We have no idea anything about Martha Levy's Jewish identity or lack thereof by looking at this painting. And as we're going to see, that is the case in all the paintings that we're going to look at. So. Don't these women look exactly alike? <laughs> um, OK, so this is our next set of portraits that we're going to look at. The portrait on the left is Abigail Levy Franks. We're going to spend the rest of our class talking about her and her family. And the portrait on the right is a woman named Jacqueline Winkler, a non-Jew. Um, they were both painted by the same artist. Um, his name was Gerardus Dykink and his name is spelled in the most insane way. I'm, I was like, I, every time I teach about this, and I've talked about this many, many times, I have to Google again how to pronounce his name, and I'm always afraid I'm not going to find it. So now it's in my notes, Dyking. It's spelled D-U-Y-C-K-I-N-C-K. -C -C -C. He was Dutch. OK, so you can see that he painted these two portraits. It's obvious that he was the same painter. They're pretty much exactly the same. They're wearing the same dress. They both have a red sort of robe around them, and they both have that window off to the side. And they look awfully similar. They're posed in the same way. They're posed in the same mm -hmm. way. So clearly, this they don't is. They look like the same artist. They look like the same portrait. Yeah. So uh, that's so interesting that you say that, Sherry, because yes. there is a little bit of a possible machloket about whether Abigail mm -hmm. Levy Franks was painted by the same artist. <laughs> I mean, I, every, it's literally everyone accepts it, except for there's one little stream in American Jewish history that's like, well, we're not really sure. Um, certainly, it's the same style, very similar. So what can we tell about these women? Similar things that we can tell about Martha Levy, right? I mean, there's nothing Jewish about, yeah? This one's holding an animal. Right, yes, yeah, she's holding a, a puppy dog, a dog, which was a um, sort of a, a symbol of you know, wealth and leisure time and things like that. You'll see there's one of somebody holding a sheep coming up. It's <laughs> a little random. Um, so clearly they're wealthy women. Clearly they're women of leisure. Um, their hands are very white, and they don't, they've clearly have, do not show that they've done work, right, at work with their hands. Um, 
there's nothing particularly sanua about the way Abigail Levy Franks is dressed. If anything, her her bosom is showing much more to the world than mm. than Jacqueline Winkler. There's nothing Jewish about either either portrait at all. Um, not surprising. These Jews are using their portraits, as we said, to become American, not to show off their Judaism. Um, their Judaism is something that's internal. So it's interesting to think about that, because portraits, if you think about it, are kind of semi-public, semi-private documents, right? Like, on the one hand, they sort of mediate between the home and the world outside the home. Um, they hang on your wall in your private home. But people come in and out, in and out of your home and they see it, whereas they wouldn't necessarily see your diary or your memoir or letters that you've written to family members. So there's something that's sort of public and sort of private about a portrait. Um, nonetheless, there's nothing Jewish in any of Abigail Levy Franks's portraits. And we're going to see there's a whole bunch of pictures of her family members as well that we're going to look at. There's no such thing as like, for example, a menorah on the sideboard that's behind her, or something that was very common oh, in the, the no, nothing around the neck, nothing, you know, she's not dressed in a modest fashion, her head isn't covered. You know, just um, thinking that they came, most of them came to America for economic purposes, right. not religious purposes. For certainly not so for religious. They certainly, for economic purposes, would want to rate with all the other people. Uh-huh, exactly, exactly, um, yeah. I noticed that they're both painted in the same studio, in the same setting. Right, unless the background's made up, which is possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, and the colors are the same, and yeah, yeah it's very, it's, they're very, very similar. But there's no, like, there's a very famous artist, and I actually thought of bringing in a, a painting that he um, painted as well. There's a very famous European Jewish artist, who's a little bit later, which is why I didn't bring him in. His name is Maurice Daniel Oppenheim. I don't know if you've heard of him. He, he paints a lot about sort of the, Encou Jewish encounter with modernity in the 19th century in Germany in Germanic states. It's amazing. Look at his art. It's incredible to look at it. There's a very famous painting of a Jewish soldier coming home for Shabbos where like the whole family is looking at him. He's got like an iron cross around his neck. He's won some kind of a medal and, and it's a Shabbos table and they're all sort of looking at him and he's looking off into the distance like he's seen other vistas of the world and it's a whole conflicted picture. But all of Maurice Daniel Oppenheim's paintings have something very Jewish in them. So. A lot of times they have what's called a Judenstern hanging from the ceiling. So, do you know what a Judenstern is? A Judenstern is, when I realized this, I fell in love Shabbos with one. A Shabbos lamp? Yes, it's a Shabbos lamp. It's a Shabbos lamp. I went, I, when I realized this, when I was studying his work a few years ago, I, I became a crazy person about a Judenstern. And I, I went on eBay and I, I went out and bought one, an antique Judenstern. So, it happened wow. some guy in Baltimore had one like in his antique collection. So, um, J U D E N S T E R N. So uh, it's, it means a Jewish star. They're shaped like stars. Um, and what they did is they, they hung them like a chandelier from in top, on, top, on the top of the table. And each arm of the star had a hollowed out place in it for oil. So that's what they light Shabbos candles in. And then their Shabbos candles lit their table up. So they had Friday night dinner with light. This was before electricity. So all his paintings have a Judenstern hanging from the ceiling. And before I knew what a Judenstern was, I remember I said to a friend of mine who's a Jewish historian, why does he have that same lamp in every single picture? Like, is, maybe it was like something he had in his studio. And he goes, no, it's a Judenstern. Every Jewish family had one of those. So, but these guys, they've done nothing. Like, there's no menorah, there's no Judenstern, there's nothing. She's just, it's just, she's the same as Jacqueline Winkler. So we can't really assess Abigail Levy Franks' Jewish identity. For all we know, her Jewish identity is equally absent as Martha Levy of the Spinet, right? We know nothing about it from the picture. But the Franks family was a very well-known family. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I'm going to now tell you the backstory about her, which is she was an incredibly affiliated and observant Jew. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So here's some more of her family. There's her again. And there are two of her children. She actually had nine children. Um, these two children are David and Phila. See, she's holding a lamb or sheep or something. Yeah. They actually were even related to Martha Levy at the Spinet. Through, they, uh, they were, I think she was her great great aunt. Abigail Levy Franks was Martha Levy's great great aunt. Um, okay. So, what do we know about Martha Levy's, uh, about um, Abigail Levy Franks? We know a ton about her. She was born in London in 1696. She was the eldest of five children from a German Jewish family. Um, the family moved to New York. 
and in, she married in America. She married another London-born Jew whose name was Jacob Franks, who was also the son of German Jewish merchants. And they had nine children, born between 1715 and 1742. This family was very much a part of New York society. They were very active, not only in New York Jewish life, but in New York society life. Um, they were, she was very much a doyen of New York society. She knew everyone there was to know. She was part of reading salons. She was very active in politics and, and culture and plays and symphony and all this kind of stuff. She was very active. Um, her husband was a trustee of Sheriff Israel. Um, he one of, was one of the four men to lay the cornerstone of the Mill Street building of the synagogue in 1729. It's not there anymore, obviously. He was the president of the shul in 1730. Um, very, very active. Um, Abigail, obviously, and her family, they, they obviously had these portraits made to hang together, right? Like they're all dressed in the same colors and the background is the same and like they're meant to hang together on the wall. Um, and, you know, they, she's clearly a woman of substance, a woman of wealth, a woman of elegance. The thing, the reason that we know a ton about Abigail Levy Franks is because she was an incredibly prolific letter writer. She actually has, that we have about 37 of her letters. It is the richest correspondence collection of any colonial woman, Jewish or non-Jewish, that exists today. The letters have been published in a book. It's very hard to read them, as you're going to see. I have a lot of excerpts of the letters that I'm going to show you. They're in ridiculous English, and everything's misspelled, and there's capitals and small case all over the place, and it's a mess. But they're fascinating, fascinating letters. They really give a view not just of colonial um, Jewish life, but of colonial life in general. To whom were these letters written? Relatives? So, OK. So where were the letters written? It's like you anticipated my next slide. The letters were written to him. This is Naftali, Hartsey, as she calls him, Franks, who was her son. The letters are all written to him. He lived in London. He was sent there, to, or he went there on his own to do business as a young man, and he stayed there, and he lived there for the rest of his life. Um, so he was her oldest child. She loved him very, very, very much. She missed him forever, and she wrote him prodigiously. So what does she write to him about? Lots of things she writes to him about. Um, New York society, she writes to him about politics, she writes to him about enlightenment books that she's reading, she writes to him about articles in, in various um, publications that she's engaged with. She does write to him a little bit about Judaism. We know she lived an observant Jewish life. Um, she kept a kosher home. She tells Naftali, his, who was at some point during this correspondence living with his uncle, don't eat anything in his house. He's not kosher enough, just eat bread and butter. She says she wants him to say prayers every morning. We know she observed Shabbat, she observed holidays, she believed in God, she believed in Judaism. But she doesn't really talk, other than reminding him not to eat anything and to daven in the morning, she doesn't talk about Judaism in her letters. She doesn't talk about Rosh Hashanah davening in her shul. She doesn't talk about, oh, I'm making seders next week. She doesn't talk about Purim. She doesn't talk about anything. She talks about New York society over and over and over again. There's no description of a Shabbos meal in her house. There's no description of what happened in shul. There, nothing, 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 nothing. In fact, she's often quite insulting about uh, the Jews in New York. She wrote in one of her letters, I don't often see any of our ladies but at synagogue, because she doesn't want to socialize with them, because they're yucky, for they are a stupid set of people, but mum for that. Like, don't tell anyone, <laughs> but I don't like them. They're yucky, and <laughs> I don't want to pay, I don't want to hang out with them. I want to hang out with my Christian friends. Um, one way we know that Judaism is sort of in her heart is the fact that she calls Naftali Hartzi, um, from hearts, you know, heart um, in Yiddish. So she calls him that for her entire exchange of letters with him. He's always referred to as Hartzi, my dear Hartzi, my beloved Hartzi, etc. Um, she always kept that sort of Yiddish term of endearment. There's no other Yiddish, there's no other Hebrew, there's no nothing in her letters about anything like that, but she did have that heart. Naftali Hartz. Oh, right, so, right. so the, for the first time, as I was, I've, I've been teaching this about these guys for years and years, the first time as I was reviewing and, and coming up with this class, I saw that somebody mentioned that perhaps it was Naftali hearts like a deer. Yeah. Yeah, so, because that's the symbol of Naftali, the son um, mm -hmm. of Yaakov. So he, as you can see, he also has a portrait painted, and there's nothing Jewish about his portrait. He may as well be George Washington in this portrait, right? So this one was painted in England. Okay. Um, 
the most fascinating thing about Abigail Levy Franks's correspondence is the reaction to the events that perhaps most defined her life and most tortured her, and that was the intermarriage of her daughter Phila. In September 1742, Phila intermarried with Oliver Delancey, as in Delancey Street. He was the son of a very prominent and successful Huguenot merchant family in New York. And the first time we hear about the marriage is from this letter, which was from Abigail's other son, David. Um, the oldest. The one in the portrait. I'll go back for a second. So this is David and Phila, these two. So David writes to Naphtali, all the family in New York were well last Friday the 27th, but in very great uneasiness and great concern on account of Phila's being married to Oliver Delancey. She has been married in September last ye, last ye eighth, and not a soul knew of it, till last week when she absented herself and went to his country house where she has remained since and had not been in town. I was very much surprised when I heard it, as I suppose my father will, or has before this time acquainted you with the particulars. I'm told he is, and my mother in great grief about it. And by the way, that's how she, he spelled grief. That was not my typo. And she married without? She married without. without telling her family, kept living in her parents' house for six months, and then finally like, gave it up and just went to his country house, and that was it. It was crazy. So clearly she knew this was not going to go over well, but she did it, which also meant that she didn't have a society wedding. She just sort of like absconded in the night. It was very crazy. So how does Abigail react? This woman who never writes about her satyrs, never writes about Rosh Hashanah, never writes about Purim, never writes about Shabbos. Here's what she writes. I am now retired from town and would from myself, if it were possible to have some peace of mind, from the severe affliction I am under on, on the conduct of that, that unhappy girl. My spirits was for some time so depressed that it was a pain to me to speak or see anyone. I shall never have that serenity nor peace within I have so happily had there hitherto. My house has been my prison ever since. And your heart breaks for her. It, she's so depressed. She is so hurt. hurt. Yeah. She's devastated by this child's intermarriage. So scholars have looked at this letter and said, what? Like, it's not like the woman expressed anything about her passion for Judaism ever in her letters. She writes about New York society. She makes fun of the ladies in shul. She happens to mention, OK, she keeps kosher. But it's like, you know, she's like socially orthodox. And you know, like she's, she doesn't care about it, sort of like pro forma, what she does. But she doesn't care. But she did care. She doesn't even mention the marriage. Right, right, that unhappy girl. It's all the hockey thing. Yeah, yeah, that unhappy girl. She may mention it. I don't remember if she exactly mentions it in the rest of the letter. This is just a little piece Her unhappiness of the letter. must also have been because the girl was secretive. Right, right, exactly. I mean, she's, she's furious with her on so many levels. She doesn't but know what to do. the girl was secretive because she knew from her parents' home, I better not talk about this. So it was a show. She knew she was in she trouble. Did, right. right, she knew she was in trouble, which is interesting. It didn't stop her. Um, and we have to think about why that, why that didn't stop her, but it did not stop her. So Because she was in love. <laughs> right, she was in love. Right, clearly she was in love, which was also like, you know, I'm a scholar of marriage. That's what I'm writing my dissertation on. And it's amazing because in 1743 in Europe, people didn't marry for love. That was like untoward. You didn't do that. Um, Non-Jews or Jews, nobody married for love. And, but in America, it was like, you know, you have to have choice and you have to have freedom and liberty and all that kind of stuff. So people married for love very early here. We know, at least from the documentation that still exists, that she never spoke to Phila again in her life. And the, our first incidence of that, hmm? There, there was a time when somebody would, the family would sit Shiva. Yes. Did they do that? So we don't have evidence that they sat Shiva, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, if she did that Jewish act, I, I don't know. But people definitely did in the colonial era here. She, yeah. It shows the relationship. She didn't. Phila did not convert, though. No, she didn't convert. She just married him. Now, that was another, it's very interesting that you point that out because, again, that was something that would have been impossible in Europe. You would have had to, if you were going to marry a Christian as a Jew, you would have had to convert. And later, later, later on in the 19th century, you could both declare yourselves without faith and then you could have a civil marriage. But certainly at this, in 1743, so early, that you would have had to convert to Christianity to marry a Christian. It just shows the, the relationship between parent and child. Yes. 
It gives a lot of insight into that relationship. It gives a lot of insight. Here right. she's, she's angry. What did she do all those years? Was she close to the child? Right. And we don't know. And we don't, we don't know. I mean, clearly... If you have so many children, frankly, you can't be close to them. Right. Not in the same way. And one that, child takes care of the next. And, and she was the old... Phyla was the oldest daughter. She so was the, she was the oldest daughter. It was Naftali, I think, and then Phyla. It may have been Naftali Boses and then Phyla, but she was the oldest daughter. So for children, sure, yeah. raising children. <laughs> yeah. So this is one. Uh, this is a letter from Jacob Franks, who was Abigail Levy Franks's husband, who writes to Naftali also. Um, I'm told Phyla writes you by the ship. I have hardly had ye sight of her since she left ye family. I'm assured she heartily repents what she has done. And therefore often am inclined to see her and give her the liberty to come see us, but cannot bring your mother to it. Therefore, desire you to answer her letter and to write your mother about her. You know, he thought that Naf she, Naftali could maybe comfort his mother. Um, Naftali, by the way, did marry a Jew, whose name was Phila, interestingly. And as did his brother Moses, they both married Jews, both of whose names were Phila. <laughs> it must have been a very popular name. Also, they both married cousins. So clearly there was a Phila in the tree, family tree or something similar. Um, so there were a lot of people, girls named Phila. Um, and so they both married Jews. So, he, so maybe, who was Jacob? Jacob was Abigail Levy Francis' husband. So he's writing to his son to his as son. well. Right, so he's saying, Phila's also sending you a letter right back to her. He's trying to maintain some connection, but Abigail could not do it. She just couldn't do it, and as far as we know, um, she never spoke to Phila again. Wow. I know, it's tragic. Look, it, oh, it hurts. So there's a scholar who wrote, who published Abigail Levy Franks' letters as a book, and she wrote a very extensive, very beautiful introduction to the book where she dwells on this um, incident. And she says, she quote, this is a quote of uh, how she explained it. Abigail's relationship with religion was conflicted, but she would never see Phila again. In the Jewish tradition, her daughter was dead. Abigail took religion for granted like nature, took it for granted like nature, and Phila had transgressed against nature. So confident was she about her own Jewish identity, enough so that she felt free to criticize the religion and the people that she was stunned to discover that her children did not experience the same fundamental loyalty to their lineage. The end of the story is that Abigail Levy Franks left no Jewish descendants at all. It's so sad. It's so sad. Of her nine children, the younger ones never married. David Franks the one who sent the letter to Naftali talking about how upset his mother was, also intermarried. He married a Christian woman named Margaret Evans, the mother of whom was a good friend of Abigail's. So they clearly met through social circles, etc. cetera. Um, their four children, David Franks and Abigail um, Evans Franks, their four children, Abigail, Jacob, Mary, and Rebecca, were all baptized and all raised as Christians. Risha who we're gonna see a picture of later on in the last slide. Um, another daughter um, may have married a Jew, but when she was 62, so she did not have children. His name was Abraham ben Baruch de Fries in 1789. Sounds it sounds, he was definitely Jewish, but we don't know if they got married. It was, for some reason, the records are not clear if they actually married or not. Um, but they had some kind of a relationship. Um, Naftali, as I said, married his first cousin, Phila, in London, and there's a lot of talk in the letters about this marriage. Um, Abigail was thrilled, as you can imagine, about that match. Please send my love to Phila. Can't wait for news of the pregnancy. Can't wait for news of the birth. You had a baby boy. I was so excited. Like, there's endless, endless discussion about the match with Phila. Um, all of Naftali's children intermarried, all of them. Um, Moses Franks, the other son who also moved to England and also married Phila, another Phila. All of his children intermarried as well. Oi. <laughs> so, what do we do with this poor woman? What do we do after hearing about Martha Levy at the Spinet? What do we do? Oh, so these are some pictures just, you know, this is another painting of um, David and Phila 
uh, they're much younger, and I don't know, maybe that one is Risha. I don't know. It seems to be a lot of confusion out there about which of these little girls is Phyla and which of them is Risha. But um, that's definitely David. And you see he's holding a bird, like a, you know, another status symbol. And you have the same scenery outside. And again, nothing Jewish uh, at all in, in the painting. Um, and then here we have, this is Moses and his wife, Phyla, the other Phyla, the third Phyla. And those paintings were um, done in England. And there's Naphtali again also. His, that painting was done in England. So I, I think a lot about these people because they had very complicated lives, Jewishly. They had a hard time sort of figuring out how to square Judaism and America. How are they going to blend the outside world with their inside world? They didn't suffer a lot of anti-Semitism. They didn't suffer a lot of legal discrimination. They were, for the most part, not just accepted, but even married by their non-Jewish neighbors here. And as we said earlier, they were not very religious, because um, if they had been religious, they wouldn't have come to America to begin with. But their Judaism was still important to them. If we think back to the previous weeks of our class, we know that the Recife 23 came here because they wanted to stay Jewish. If they didn't care about staying Jewish, they would have stayed in Recife. We know that these people founded synagogues. We know that they tried to keep people observant. They, which was very, very difficult. We know they had Jewish pride and they cared about how the external world saw them as Jews. So they did care about Judaism. And certainly we know that Abigail Levy Franks cared passionately about her Jewish line continuing. They just didn't know how to transmit that care in a way that carried on. Now, some of it is not their fault. You know, it's very easy, you know, I, I, when, I, when I read about Abby Levy Franks, every once in a while you'll come across a scholar who says, we shouldn't blame her. You know, the mother is always blamed, right? And if something happens to the child, the mother's blamed. The mother didn't do this, the mother didn't do that. Um, I remember, you know, I had a neighbor growing up who, when my, my siblings and I went to Jewish day school, um, when we started going to Jewish day school, the neighbor, who was a very good friend of mine, said to me, my parents say that going to Jewish day school is like going to a blind school. And I was like, what? I was very little. I didn't understand what she meant. She said, it's your only you're only with other people who are just like you, and you don't get to know how, how to work in the real world, how to operate in the real world. And I sort of brushed it off. I told my mother about it, and my mother rolled her eyes and whatever. That was that. And the end of that story was, of course, that two out of those three children had absolutely no Jewish identity whatsoever. One of them is, inter one of them passed away, but one of them is intermarried as a Christmas tree. Her children are not being raised as Jews, has no Jewish identity whatsoever. And that devastated the parents. They were so sad about that. One child went completely in the opposite direction, became from and lives in Israel. So that was the other sort of outcome, but that happened because of my family largely. But I still like remember that 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 you know my mother my mother said well you know what do you expect if that's what the parent tells the child how what how should the children turn out of course they have a Christmas tree in their house she said that you guys were going to a blind school instead of you know a Jewish day school um, but we do sometimes blame the mother too much right it's not just the mother in this case um, the society was really hard it was really 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 hard to continue yourself Jewishly here. It was a wasteland. It's very hard for us to imagine what a wasteland it was. It would be like if you can imagine your heads for a minute picking up your family and moving to Wyoming, Idaho. Forget Wyoming, it's too Jewish. Idaho, Idaho. Um, and there's no internet and no airplanes. And no FedEx. And no FedEx, right? Like imagine that, like you move to Wyoming now. So, that's what it was like here. Worse. <laughs> it was worse than that. So it was hard for them to figure it out, no matter how good they were about transmitting their Jewish identity to their children. The external world was still going to be enticing. This external world was still going to be amazing. 
there was still one tenth of one percent of the population here. I mean, you know, we we feel like minorities in this country, not so much in Riverdale or in New York, even in general, but we we know we're minorities in this country, and we are over two percent of the country, and that counts places like Idaho and Wyoming, right? In New York, we're probably more like ten or fifteen percent of the state, and that counts upstate and other places like that. So. One tenth of one percent. Oh, how do you? How do you keep some kind of feeling of Judaism in, in a situation like that? So, when I think about this, like I, I find these people so compelling because I actually think that their lives are a whole lot like ours in some ways, and that's what I want to spend the rest of the time talking with you about. They are a lot like us in the sense that we too live in a very, very compelling society that is very kind and very welcoming. We have very little anti-Semitism, unfortunately it seems to be growing now, but very little anti-Semitism, very little discrimination in this country, certainly there's no economic discrimination anymore. We also, particularly us, as modern Orthodox Jews, struggle how much should we fit into America, how much should we differentiate ourselves as Jews? What messages should we be transmitting to our children about that? We also wonder, are we accurately and effectively transmitting our Jewish values to our kids? You know, my husband and I have this ongoing thing that like our kids refuse to sing Zmirot at the Shabbat table. They won't do it. Now, two of my kids go to Moshevah every summer and they sing Zmirot for a hundred million hours on Friday night and Shabbat day, but they will not sing Zmirot. So we, we like, what are we doing? We're not teaching our children Zmirot. Like we're not, making them sit at the table and sing. So I actually now have a new thing. One of my colleagues, Rebecca Wolf, who's also a history teacher here, she said, I, I was talking to her about it, and she said, here's what we do. My husband and I sit at the table and we start singing. And they're off doing this, playing Lego and reading and whatever, and they, they creep back to the table. So that's our new thing. We're gonna try to do that and you know, see what happens. But you know, we struggle with that all the time. Like even us in the relatively from community that we live in, we still wonder, are we transmitting the right values? Are we doing enough? Are we trying hard enough? Modern orthodoxy, as you all know, has come under a great deal of attack in recent years for lacking soul, right? It lacks soul. We don't discuss belief. We don't discuss faith. We don't discuss God. I don't know how many of you saw Jay Lefkowitz's article about social orthodoxy that came out um, about was it last a year ago about yeah Four. yeah it was it was a it was a difficult piece to read uh, I went actually went to college with his younger brothers I thought it was a very well written article if you haven't read it get it it's online somewhere I think it was, so basically he said that you know many 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 Orthodox Jews are not actually um, believing Jews they are going through the motions of Orthodoxy for social reasons. Um, and I mean, he basically said, that's okay. <laughs> like it's, it's all right. And you know, it's, it's something to be aware of and perhaps to be slightly concerned about, but he was okay with it, with social orthodoxy. To me, I worry, well, if we're being socially orthodox, and I actually think a lot of the modern orthodox community is socially orthodox, a lot. Um, there is something that's very powerful about belonging to an orthodox social community. It's very all encompassing. Um, there's a certain, I hate to say it, elitism in our, in our Orthodox communities. We look down on other Jews, we look down on non-Jews. Um, we are insular, we circle the wagons. We have customs that really work for socializing. Um, we have, that keep everybody warm and enclosed and feeling a uh, sense of community, which is so hard in the modern world. All of those things are very compelling about Orthodoxy, the social aspect of Orthodoxy and the halachic aspect too, even if you're not doing it for halachic reasons. And I think that you know we we don't spend enough time perhaps thinking about well you know are we talking about belief are we talking about God are we talking about faith are we talking about our closeness to our tradition our internal spiritual lives I know I'm speaking to you to myself and letting you listen because do I do that I don't know. On some level, are we perhaps living our lives like colonial Jewish portraits, with our Jewish passions very deep inside of us, only to maybe see the day of light, the day of light, <laughs> the light of day, when it's maybe too late? So, 
This is my, my last portrait. This is, I think, this is Risha and not Phyla. Very beautiful. Again, made to hang with that other set of portraits. Very beautiful young woman. So I wanted to share another model for a minute and hear what you have to think about it. And that's a model that was espoused by the rabbi and 20th century Jewish philosopher, Abraham Joshua Heschel. So I know all of you have heard of him. I'm just going to give you a really brief recap on his life in case you don't know his biography. He was born in Europe in 1907. Um, he was descended from a line of, of great Hasidic rabbis, both sides of his family, from his mother's side and his father's side. Um, he got a traditional Jewish education, a yeshiva. He received smicha at a young age, and then he went on and got his doctorate at the University of Berlin. Um, and he also got a liberal rabbinic ordination at um, the Hochschule, which was kind of like a JTS, maybe more right wing than something between JTS and YU, maybe a Cholave. Um He was still in Europe in 1938 when um, the Nazis had long taken over, um, and he was living in Frankfurt. He was arrested by the Gestapo. He was deported to Poland, spent 10 months lecturing in Warsaw at their Institute for Jewish Studies. And then, this is truly a miracle if you think about the meaning that this man had for the 20th century Jewish mind and going forward. Six weeks before the German invasion of Poland, six weeks before essentially, right, the end of the Jews in Poland, because the minute the Nazis marched in, basically it was over for them. They couldn't leave. There was nowhere for them to go. They weren't let out. Six weeks before he left Warsaw for London, he was uh, sent out by um, Julian Morgenstern, who was the president of Hebrew Union College in America at the time, got him into London, and eventually brought him to the United States in 1940. Most of his family died in the Holocaust. He served um, on the faculty of HUC for five years, and then he took the position that we all know um, at the Jewish Theological Seminary, where he served as a professor for 40, 30 something years um, until his death in 1972. So, why do I bring him up? I bring him up because one of my most favorite quotes ever was by him. This is, I, you can see what a nerd I was in high school when you hear that this was a quote that was on my yearbook page. Um, this quote that's up here. Remember that there is meaning beyond absurdity. Know that every deed counts, that every word is power. Above all, remember that you must build your life as if it were a work of art. So I was spending all this time thinking about works of art, right? These paintings, these portraits, there's nothing Jewish about them. Everything Jewish is internal. She's having trouble expressing her Judaism. Maybe she, you know, um, with, with uh, Martha Levy, she isn't Jewish at all. And here is this man who's saying that every deed counts, every word is power, build your life like it's a work of art. Your life has to be the work of art. It's not the work of art that's hanging on the wall that doesn't really depict your life, but depicts the society that you want access to, but rather your life has to be that, that work of art. So I kind of think that he's the antithesis of living his Jewish life internally. I know you all know that he was very involved with the civil rights movement, and he marched with Martin Luther King Jr. In, at Selma. And another one of my most favorite things that Abraham Joshua Heschel ever said was, um, when I marched in Selma, my feet were praying. I'm sure that you've all heard that line. Every time I hear that line, I get the chills. I think it's just the most extraordinary line. Talk about transmitting how he feels about religion, how he feels about his connection to God, how he feels about spirituality. That's all he did. His books were God in search of man, man in search of God. You know, he talks about God incessantly. That's all he talked about, his relationship with faith, his relationship with tradition, etc. We can't all be Abraham Joshua Heschel. God knows I can't. Um, but I wonder if maybe when we look back at these colonial Jews, we can feel perhaps a warning a warning from Abigail Levy Franks calling to us from beyond and saying, don't do what I did. Talk to your kids about what it means to you. Don't just make fun of the women in shul. Tell them what it means to you, what God means to you, what the Jewish people mean to you, what Shabbos means to you, what Pesach means to you. Model it for them. Because what you model for them may be what you get out on the other end. And again, I don't want to blame her. 
I feel bad for her. She had a really tough road ahead of her in this country. She came here as a child. It's not like she chose to come here. She clearly came from a Jewishly affiliated family, but it was really hard here. And it was, as I've said many times today, it was really, really hard here. So I can't blame her. But I do think we can look back at her and maybe think to ourselves, what could we do differently? We who live also in a world in which we're very accepted, in which we've attained economic success, in which we've attained complete integration into the external society, and in which we care so passionately and so deeply about Jewish continuity, or we wouldn't be sitting here at SIR, right, today. So, you know, that <laughs> I'm a Jewish historian, that's what I do. I study Jewish history, oh my, <laughs> you're seeing pictures of my family. Um, I study Jewish history because I love it, but also because there's something that becomes magical about it in moments like this. You can look, study people like Abigail Levy Franks, you can study people like Martha Levy at the spinet, and all of a sudden, you for a second feel like you're looking in a mirror. And that to me is what is so incredibly, incredibly magical about studying Jewish history, is that every struggle that we go through today, somebody else in our heritage went through. Thousands, millions of people in our heritage went through. And I like to use that piece of Jewish history to try to help us inform where we should be going forward, how we should be looking at ourselves, how we can learn from their actions and their mistakes and their wonders, their wonderful things. So those are my words about colonial Jewish portraiture, about modern orthodoxy, <laughs> and it's sort of like a little more sermonizing than history teaching, but what do you think? I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but does this resonate with you? Do you feel that, I mean, how do you feel about poor Ab Ab Abigail Levy Franks? Do you feel sorry for her? Do you? I, I think the relationship between parents and children not that it's always so marvelous now, but there was such a difference that you have to start these things when they're very young. Right. When right. they're very young and it becomes right. part of that. And they don't know enough, before they know enough to rebel. Right. At least it's part of their life. Right. I, you know, I, sometimes my husband will say to me, you know, I'll be grating and stressed out about this and that, and, and he'll say, just like, give them cereal for Shabbat dinner. And I say, absolutely not. We are going to eat on china with silver and a beautiful tablecloth and my children are going to grow up remembering the Shabbos table as being this incredibly lovely meal where we ate delicious food and we laughed together and we sat there for a long time and, and my grandmother and and thanks me wrote that they didn't participate in but you're not going to laugh <laughs> right yeah exactly they'll be running away but but you know right we have to model that for them and it doesn't have to be porcelain Right, yeah, yeah. You know, you see so many parents who wonder why their children is married, and they're not observant at all. They don't, they don't. Like my friend's parents. Now, of course, it happens to people who, you know, you would never imagine, right? Like, it, it, it can happen to any of us. My mother always says to me, you're doing everything you can do, and I really think it will work out for you, but you <laughs> never know. <laughs> No, if they enjoy observance, if they right. enjoy religion, the joy, right. then they, they right. will, this, this is the, the life they will Right, lead. right. And the joy that we feel in it is so important for them to see. You know, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law is an incredibly joyous woman. And she does every Chag and every Jewish everything with incredible, incredible joy. And I learned from her, she always says, I hate when people complain about Pesach. <laughs> she gets a little on her high horse. I hate when people complain about it. And um, she never does. For her, it's all about, isn't this wonderful? Look, here's my great-grandmother's chopping bowl, and here's Safta's candlesticks, and here are the blue glass dishes that we love and we use every year, and isn't this wonderful, and isn't this wonderful? And it does make a difference. You know, ask my children what's their favorite Chag of the year. They will tell you Pesach. They will tell you Pesach because in my family it's beloved and in my husband's family it's beloved and there's so much joy surrounded and nobody says, oh my God, I have to change the dishes and this and that. And the family is around the table and that's what gives, gives the warmth. Right. 
Now, I, I don't want to, by the way, say that I'm perfect about this, because as you can see, I'm totally not Mitchell and Tonsing's me wrote on many other things. But I do think, right, there's so much that we can learn about reminding ourselves that we have to be out there. We have to be out there about how we're passionate about it. And grandparents can do that, and parents can do that. And you have to grab those moments and just make sure you're celebrating them and not and not keeping them inside and not just being that, that portrait of a good American, socially orthodox Jew. Remembering that it's so important to, to transmit that. I, I, she breaks my heart every time I teach about her. She absolutely breaks my heart. I, I feel so badly for her. And I often wonder if there was anything she could have done to save her line. You know, my mother always says, my mother's probably watching this. Um, my mother always says, I just want my line to stay Jewish. Now, all three of her children marry Jews, all her grandchildren are being raised Jewish, in varying levels of religiosity, um, but she always says, I just want my line to survive. And that's what she wanted. Abigail Levy Franks just wanted her line to survive, and I wonder if there's anything she could have done given the circumstances she was living in. But I know there is what we can do, and maybe that's what we can learn from her from these portraits, yeah. Didn't you previously say that there really was no Jewish education? Yeah, there was very, it was practically so nothing. There was a amazing. school at Sheriff Israel. Yeah, but you said it was only a year ago. Yeah, a year it ago. closed, it opened, it closed, it opened, yeah. Her children were enrolled so in it not, for some period of time. It's not surprising. It's not surprising at all. But why didn't they open the schools? I mean, they could have, there were enough, there were a few hundred Jews in New York. They could have had a school. They didn't care enough. They did, but they didn't, you know? Yeah. It seems to me that all of that you described is what we're living now. Absolutely. A hundred percent. That's why it speaks to me. So it's what we're living now. It's, it's scary and also heartening. That's right. It's scary. <laughs> it, it's so different than the early 20th century, for example. Like sometimes you think what's more, the more recent past is more like us today. But it's not, it's the colonial period that's like today. In the sense of us being so accepted and so integrated and struggling to keep ourselves Jewish. I mean, it was, we're, not living, we're not living in the Lower East Side, right? In, in the early part of the 20th century, the pe most of the people who came from Russia especially were poor. Right. And right. they held That's together. Economic I think affluence uh, changes people. Yeah, and we're our community. And I mean, thank God, more. we're the most affluent Jewish community, right? Thank God, but also it comes with its struggle. Right. Yeah. I remember seeing something recently that the immigrants who came, one of the first things they did was go have their pictures taken. To yes. Back. Yes. And yes. And in a similar way, That's they wanted right. to show how. They were they it's were so true. You know what? You're giving me a great idea for a further lesson. Comparing those pictures wow. with the portraits. Because they, they would get the, they, the pictures are fabulous. Sort of yes, dresses. that's right. They, they got themselves the all dressed up and they put themselves in front of fancy things. Mm -hmm. And as like in the 1920s, they put themselves in front of automobiles. And you know, they set themselves up to look very, very wealthy. And oftentimes they had borrowed the clothing or you know, the photographer gave them the clothing. Yeah. And you know what else they did, though? And this is sort of on the other side. They, um, they pasted in, they photoshopped in pictures of the relatives from Europe. And they hung those poor pictures in their house. They sent them back to Europe, but they also hung them on their walls. They cut out pictures of their family members from photographs they had of their family members, and they pasted them into the picture, which is so poignant and so beautiful. So they had both of like trying to fit into America and look how successful we are, but they also were trying to hold on. I mean, there's a very famous picture of actually of Ed Koch's family that's in the American Jewish Historical Society archives of him, the picture of his family that was, you know, this beautiful American picture with the European people pasted it on the side. And you can tell they don't exactly fit. Um, yeah, that's a great, I'm going to remember that. That's a good idea for a, a lesson someday. Also, wasn't the two sons that intermarried in they were in London, so was the yes. atmosphere in London also similar? Yes, it was very similar. The Jews hadn't been in England for 350 years, so when they came back to England, the types of Jews who came back were similar to the kinds of Jews who agreed to come here. It was a wasteland. 
Um, now, by the, by the 1730s, 40s, 50s, it wasn't such a wasteland anymore, but, but it, it was a little better than America, but it wasn't great. People who cared about being Jewish were in Poland, um, Germany. They were not in England. They were also the people who had gone for economic reasons and who it was second on the list, their Jewish identity, not number one. Could you please explain something to me that really is not so relevant? I heard on the Shalom TV, there's um, central orthodoxy and modern orthodoxy. <laughs> What's the yeah. difference? What are they? So that's a topic for an entire class, but <laughs> I'll regal a yeah. on one leg. Um, I would say that centrist orthodoxy is a new phenomenon that has um, emerged out of the critique of the more right wing of modernity and of modern orthodoxy. It's, um, there's actually just an article that came out about this that YU used to call itself modern orthodox and now calls itself centrist orthodox. Um, I asked Robert yeah. Fox about this. When oh, really? He had, when he put out uh, you know, that annual data on day schools. Uh -huh. um, and I believe what he told me is that centrist orthodox, yeah. his data is uh, single-sex uh, schools and modern uh, Okay, so he's drawing a line in a specific place. It's certainly a group that is less interested in integration, integration with the modern world. Well, like this woman on, you know, on, on the Shalom channel said, <coughs> um, modern orthodox mumche. Modern orthodox mumche. Expert? No, but I'm mumche. Mahadrin. Oh, Mahadrin. Oh, modern. Oh, modern Orthodox Mahadrin. Right. Like I said, I think that actually that's a very good definition. Mm -hmm. That it's the separate sex schools. Yeah. Thank you. That, that was Rabbi Lamb's term. Centrist or modern? Centrist. Centrist. Yeah. He, did, well, he never liked the modern term. Yeah. And, and what he, about of course, Abby he Weiss? Pretty modern. What about Abby Well, Weiss? then again, to open. That's a whole other <laughs> class. Come back. We'll do a class <laughs> okay, on okay, different right. kinds of Orthodoxy. And it was Torah true. Yeah, that didn't take off. Yeshivish versus Haredi versus Hasidish versus, you know, there's all sorts of permutations. No other movement has as many permutations as we do. And, you know. Well, in Israel, a lot of the communities, you can tell by what they wear on their head. Right, and their modern orthodox is not modern orthodox, it's Dati Lumi, which is a totally different thing, and it's very complicated. Kipashuka. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank it was wonderful so to be teaching you the past few weeks. I hope we'll do it again sometime. Hopefully. Yeah.